Hello, I'm Ann McLean. And I'm Michelle Lambert Glimp for Concerts from the Library of Congress. We're delighted to be talking with pianist Conrad Tau and dancer and choreographer Caleb Teicher, who will be opening the library's 2021 virtual concert season with a stunning program of music and dance. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. I know that you've been working over the past two years on several projects, but I think this is your first duo collaboration together. Is that correct? That is correct. We're so pleased to have your performance premiering on our Concerts from the Library of Congress platforms. This is a heartwarming and charming, beautiful hour, and we are very interested in finding how you put it together. And Michelle, you had a question about this, which I loved about this process. Yeah, I was, I was looking over some videos and my interest was, how do you balance the music, the dance, and the technology in our new world today? Um, I'll kick it off by just saying that uh, from, a, from a really maybe dry perspective, it's a lot of it is about sound mix and, and video. And we were super lucky to have uh, a great audio engineer and video engineer for this project. So a lot of the things that allow the, the clarity of our work to come through through a digital platform is just because we were working with really talented professionals in, in, from a technological standpoint. From an artistic standpoint, I think Conrad and I, when we work together, are always trying to allow space for, for our, our you know, perspectives to be seen independently of one another, and then trying to find unique and, and sort of diverse ways of pairing ourselves. So you know, maybe, maybe a creative exercise that we had very early on was just saying, well, Conrad should take a solo, and I should take a solo. And then we should do something together and say we do something together that's slow or we do something together that's fast or we do something together that feels uh, punchy, humorous or something that feels more tender. And, uh, you know, even just with broad strokes like that, trying to imagine. Uh, I actually think one of the original titles potentially for this program was all the things we are or something or all the things you are, because we were trying to say uh, we we are, of course, a pianist and a dancer, but we are also so many things. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Conrad, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, yes, I echo Caleb's thoughts that like, um, we were lucky to have a really good crew. Um, and, and, and also like actually having a crew made filming it a lot more enjoyable than if we had just been trying to do something completely ourselves. Um, it meant that we had like two friends uh, who were helping us out who were actually there to listen and be present live with us which i think makes all the difference um and also yes so i this is our first duo collaboration and i think in some ways uh it's like It's a conversation, it's a constant conversation. I think Caleb and I are both interested in ways of uh, f finding moments where we can attempt to like translate across the ways in which um, our practices are different. Um, but also, maybe more importantly, I think we try to find our space of overlap that is fairly distinct from anything that we do, um, it, me in my life as a concert pianist normally, and Caleb in his normal life as a dancer and choreographer. Um, this this feels to me a lot like a, um, I, I am usually connecting with Caleb at like a sonic and musical level, but uh, which is really to say like at a level of presence and feeling. Um, I'm not necessarily engaged with Caleb directly at the level of I'm not looking at his feet in this video for example like we're kind of mm -hmm. connecting across a different um, the wavelength is hard to exactly define it, it's it's it, it has components of motion in it it has components of sound in it it is like it, it, it's it's this thread that I think especially when we're playing together um, in this program like it, it's just finding that connective thread and then just writing it and really trying to like stay accountable to it. And so for me, I think the substance of it is primarily social and, 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 and it's like connective in that sense where it's just like you're meeting the person and then you're just trying to stay with them and you're, you're trying to listen to them and listen for them and, 
and that's that's uh, how I would say we think about balancing it. Cool. It seems so seamless the way that you've put it together, both the music that you've chosen and the the sequences and everything, and also the space seems wonderful. Where where did you record this with that big wall of books? We recorded, uh, the sound was done by Ryan Streber, uh, who runs Octaven Studio here in New York. And uh, that's also where we filmed. You know, we were uh, thinking, watching so much of what you did, and there was such a feeling of intimacy about the Bach, the way that you chose to begin the program with the Bach Goldberg Variations aria. How did you come to that piece? Mm -hmm. And is it improvised? Your dance improvise, Caleb? Uh, yeah, I actually could say essentially all of the dancing I do in the program, with the exception of three pieces, which is maybe about 10 minutes of the 60 minute program is completely improvised, mostly because it would allow me the, the opportunity to be fully present and to make uh, sonic and visual and, you know, what have you, spiritual choices based on how we felt on the day of the recording. That's not to say that we didn't practice. It just means that we uh, we we leave the the moment to decide how it should go. Um, in terms of the Goldberg variations, I have a I have a long history with that particular material. It's probably the first piece of classical music I came to love as a dancer. Um, when I first moved to New York, and I was about seventeen or eighteen, I encountered the Goldberg variations and became really captivated with Glenn Gould's recordings. And the mm -hmm. first yeah longer piece I made for my dance company was a, a version of the Goldberg Variations. Mm -hmm. um, they're very virtuosic. They feel very tap dance-y to me, um, uh, just, just in their sort of construction. Uh, and of course, the aria bookends uh, most performances of the Goldberg Variations. You play at the beginning, you play the 32, 33 variations, and then you, then you get out. Um, and I think it was one of the first places where I, I felt like I could talk to Conrad about classical reps that I really felt connected to, that I had really listened to, um, you know, for hours and hours and hours. And I think uh, in our original draft for the, for the duo program, we had planned to do the aria at the beginning and the end and to do a number of variations in the middle. And at some point, it just didn't feel right to do the variations, but we still felt like starting and ending with the aria felt, felt like an artistic statement that we felt uh, really connected to. It's a wonderful shape, the way you know, the arc that you've created. And mm -hmm. you were saying, you were talking about your, your experience as a young dancer. I was telling Michelle that I read that you'd come to New York as a 17 year old or something like that. And yesterday, Michelle, you and I were talking about Caleb's background. And I wondered, maybe you want to talk with him a little bit about how you started out both as a percussionist and a dancer. Sure, yeah, I, I danced on my bed as a kid, the way that kids <laughs> jump up and down on their, on their beds. I was really into, I mean, we're talking five or six years old. I was really into in sync and uh jagged edge and maybe his name was puff daddy at the time or maybe it was p diddy i don't even know i forget what era of, of p diddy it was um but in any case i just moved to music but lots of kids do that my parents tried to put me in dance class and i wasn't having it because it was uh it was girl territory and i felt really freaked out by 30 little girls in pink tutus and i i just didn't i didn't feel comfortable there um Anyway, uh, but I was put into drum lessons because a friend's mother was an excellent drum teacher. And that was the first thing I studied. And that was super rigorous. She was a Juilliard trained classical percussionist. And I learned sort of the world of academic uh, rhythmic notation and rhythmic understanding. And I, I sort of learned it very academically. And then when I was 10 years old, I was watching TV and there was some sort of star search competition. This is pre so you think you can dance. Um, but I saw these two guys tap dancing and I said, wow, that makes a lot of sense to me. It just, it just looks like the type of thing that I would enjoy doing. It just looks like something I want to do. Um, and I found a local tap dance class and from the age of 10 to 17 at Snowballs where I was taking one class a week. And then I was looking for summer intensives that would offer tap dance. And then suddenly I was going to these festivals and suddenly I was looking for private instruction in 
you know, it's, it's sort of like anything that you get into as a kid, it starts as, uh, you know, a, a, a moment, just something that you think that, oh, this will be fun to do after school. And then suddenly here I am, 27, a professional tap dancer. Um, and I can't imagine my life any other way. But yes, I did. I was a sort of after school dancer. I would, you know, go to, went to public school and just took my dance classes after school. And then when it came time to make a decision about the next phase in my life, I decided that I wanted to give dancing, quote, a shot. So I moved to New York and was planning to take a gap year. And I am still on that gap year 10 years later. <laughs> well, one of the one of the things, questions I have would be, what do you guys find most inter interesting? And I'll start with you, Conrad. Interpreting old music or creating new music, improvisation, what, what, what drives you? Well, the the great joy of being a musician um, and, and actually specifically a musician who plays old music but also plays newer music, I'm a composer myself, um, and also improvisation is increasingly a large part of my music making. Uh, the, the great joy of it is that it all actually connects quite, uh, it all eventually starts to connect. Um, I think that I think that um, what playing a lot of newer music across across my uh, musical life has given me is an, an approach to specifically the medium of like musical notation. Uh, it gives me this new muscle uh, with which to find spontaneity, um, and it gives me a way of thinking about the code of musical notation as as being like prompts almost. Um, the questions that I get to ask as a performer are essentially like, why is the code this way? Why these markings? Why this here? Like, why these indications? Um, and so I can return to the Goldberg variations and, and look at that score, which, you know, maybe the piece seems really familiar, maybe we've heard a lot of recordings of it, but because I've had experience playing newer music in which I literally have to reconfigure my relationship to this code, um, it allows me to return to the older work with a, a newer, richer um, frame of reference. And so, and, and then in terms of working with Caleb, um, Caleb brings in by being a tap dancer, like we are already expanding uh, these pieces. You know, we're already like taking Bach outside of the realm of the familiar. I'm we're taking it out of the realm of my familiar, and so I think that like I think this program actually does a good job of illustrating how um, I think for both Caleb and myself this relationship to older traditions and works that came before us and people who came before mm -hmm. us. Um, is part and the, the respect for that is part and parcel of the desire to make something new and the desire to make something that is accountable to the moment in which it's happening. Uh, I think it's it uh, it all connects. Mm -hmm. You know when Kate. you were yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, Caleb, did you have anything to add? I could. <laughs> um, Mostly in that I, I I think what I'd like to offer is that Conrad's interest in music and, and I guess my interest in music as well, but I really think about Conrad when I think about someone who has quote an eclectic taste. Um, and I, you know, every time someone says, oh, what kind of music do you listen to? And I think everyone says they have an eclectic taste. Um, but I think Conrad might take the cake on that in that we, we've spent a lot of our friendship over the years sharing music back and forth. And one day he'll send me music that is from the sort of classical canon. And then the next day he'll send me an hour and a half long set of two house DJs in Belgium or something. And then the next day he'll send me the background music from a video game. Um, and so I think uh, though of, of course, maybe what our artistic practice might be is, is limited from a perspective and we are trying to expand that as much as possible. Uh, the, the things that we're aware of as artists is, is an even wider umbrella, uh, essentially what the information that we take in and the things that we've learned to appreciate beyond the things that we've learned to sort of produce ourselves are really wide. So I think it's really valuable to sort of always be thinking about the continuum of yes, of classical music, yes, of tap dance, but also the continuum of 
of all the things that we've seen or, or listened to or sort of come to appreciate in our lives. I also should say just uh, from my perspective as a dancer, there is no way to tap dance without uh, sort of dialoguing with the continuum of tap dance and sort of the greater umbrella of, of black American dance forms. Um, you know, and, and that is part of the value of tap dance. The value of the tap dance is the tradition and recognizing that even your, even your present day performance dialogues with the history and it dialogues with what is presently happening. And hopefully it dialogues with the future of the art form as well. We were talking yesterday afternoon about um, the Honey Coles sequence that you do and Brenda Buffalino, which is wonderful. And um, you said something in an email when we were going back and forth about looking into whether the uh, the copyright was okay and everything. And you said, this is something we should talk about. And it is something to talk about how many of these great dancers like Honey Coles, a tap icon, were not receiving the attention that they should have received in terms of uh, recognition rights, royalties, and so on. And I wanted to ask you to talk about that. And yesterday, Michelle, you and I were talking about the roots of this music being older than, much older, half a century, a hundred years older than jazz in the times oh, yes. of slavery. Did you want Yeah. Did you want to comment at all? Yeah, I mean, I think we we could spend many hours talking about this but i'll i'll just hopefully open up maybe a rabbit hole that people want to go down to to consider the the extent to which uh dance forms like tap dance that come out of uh, african american communities have or have not successfully uh or been given the opportunity to successfully uh receive the structure receive the infrastructural um support receive the platform and receive the sort of, uh, um, what's the word, uh, accountability that, that, other, that other forms of art have in the space of copyright and licensing and rights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be dancing the Honey Coles and Brenda Buffalino soft shoe. And that is because of a personal relationship with Brenda Buffalino that I've cultivated um, as her students and as her friend. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of system that exists beyond that, uh, it, it doesn't exist in the way that, that composers recognize it as valuable to copyright your work and to receive royalties and, and to receive um, the sort of legal recognition that the work was created by someone. And if it's meant to be used in the future, that that should be acknowledged or considered. Um, I think tap dance has done a pretty good job of trying to to keep its information, um, the quality of its information, the integrity of its information really tight, um, and which usually has to do with a person-to-person -person relationship, like my relationship with Brenda. Not only did I, of course, have permission to do it, but I also received coachings with her for about four hours on the work and on dancing in general um, in advance of this performance. Uh, this was in the before times, um, in uh, February of this year. And, and that is how the integrity of the work is being maintained. There's no, there's no Coles and Buffalino estates. Um, mm -hmm. But I, in many ways, I'm super valuable for the sort of personal connection that it, that is required to receive the information uh, that tap dance history has to offer. But at the same time, I also would love to see um, greater infrastructure, greater accountability, and and greater sort of uh, protection for the for the now century of tap dance material that hopefully will live on for many more centuries. Um, we could talk about this forever, but uh, <laughs> that's a start. It's yeah. fascinating. And we were yes. talking about it yesterday that uh, exactly what you're saying. And this program is really a nod to tap heritage and history in many ways. And you exhibit an incredible uh, range of styles and so on. We could talk about also, but before we, uh, go further into um, the, the Gershwin, which is so important for us, I was going to say that the library has a massive database of tap dance history. Uh, you probably know about it. Any tap fans out there or dance fans can look at this. Constance Vallis was the scholar who put it together, Tap Dance in America. And so you can read a biographical note about Honey Coles and about Brenda Buffalino and about you and so on. But I wanted to talk about 
the Gershwin, which is so cool and it's so exciting from so many ways, so many points of view. Michelle has a huge perspective on this. We actually have a history with the Gershwin family and we own the Gershwin collection. So you want to talk a little bit about that and then we can talk about um, the shows. Yeah, one, one question I have, Conrad, is this is your own arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue, right? I'm understanding that correctly. For, I know you, yeah, for the most part, yes. For the most part? Yes. <laughs> um, I know you opened the New York Philharmonica season a couple of years ago playing this and a work of your own. Um, how did this all come about? Uh, did you have a love of, of Gershwin or Rhapsody in Blue or, you know, I, well, I've, I first played Rhapsody in Blue in 2008. And uh, I think my very first exposure to it was when I was um, five or six years old and saw um, Fantasia 2000 in theaters. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it's a piece that has been really in my life in some form for a really long time, at this point for most of my life probably. And uh, it's it's a piece I've always had like uh, strong feelings about and a, and a desire to like make my own and uh, it's a piece that spoke to my uh, early love of improvisation in its sort of improvisatory form. Uh, it's a piece that spoke to the part of me that loved um, movie musicals as a child. I, I remember when I discovered the clip, uh, the Rhapsody in Blue sequence from King of Jazz, um, and just like feeling like that's exactly how I want it to sound in my head. Uh, there's a recording of this piece by Earl Wilde, um, and uh, I don't, I think it's with a Paul Whiteman Orchestra, and it's this incredible arrangement with choir and stuff. So I think I have had this music in my bones for a while, and I, I think I've also always had this uh, idea in my mind of it being um, malleable as well, and 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 existing in a lot of different contexts. I'm also thinking about like Eumir uh, Diodato's take on it back in like the '70s. So. It's, yeah, it's it's a piece that I'm really familiar with and have played with orchestra many times. This is my first time playing it in more of a, without an orchestra. Uh, mm -hmm. This is my first time playing it without the larger ensemble and so accounting for some of the larger orchestral sections myself. And uh, in some of this, uh, some of the transcription begins from uh, Gershwin's own take on it, but a lot of it is my own uh, uh, experience having played this piece with orchestra trying to like just reflect on how uh, how this piece exists in my ears um, but the pleasure of doing it with caleb here uh was like m was very multi-dimensional but one of the things that i found really joyous was finding particular moments to um to let uh the musical material of the rhapsody uh, completely be embodied by Caleb. Like there, we have particular moments where I think Caleb, uh, where the focus moves uh, in a specific direction. I, I don't know, like I, I, I don't want to spoil anything per se, but, um, but you know, it, it was a great joy to think about how to make um, tap dance, uh, how to highlight how tap dance has this melodic capacity by finding specific moments in the Gershwin to express that. Maybe that's uh, enticing and vague enough. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you guys did an extraordinary job doing that. Um, I, I think it's gonna be something wonderful for the audience to be a part of. Now, I don't know if, you know, if you're aware, we, have, we actually have the original manuscript of Rhapsody in Blue. And if by chance you were here at the library, we would have laid it out for you. Um, and, you know, we have many Gershwin items here, Be, you know, Gershwin, the Gershwin family is very near to us. Here at the library, we actually have the Gershwin room, which consists of, it's made up as of the Gershwin's apartment in New York. We have the piano, we have his typewriter, we even have his pencil sharpener. And uh, so it touches us to have this particular piece being performed for the Library of Congress. And do you, 
do you remember, Michelle, we had a, a very famous tap figure. Was it when we acquired the collection from the family? Yes, it was when we acquired the collection from the family. And I think the um, famous vaudeville um, tap dancer, John Bubbles, if I'm, if I'm saying it correctly. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he actually, yeah. you know, was part of our performance. And we also had the young and talented at the time, Savion Glover, who also performed here at the Library of Congress on the Coolidge Auditorium stage as part of that acquisition of the Gershwin collection. Yeah. I think so, he was you know, only 12 or something at the time. Oh, very, very, very young, young, very young. And he actually came back to us as an adult and performed once again on our on our stage. Um, I can't remember what it was for, but remarkable young man. So um, I just find it so interesting to have tap dancing and Rhapsody, Rhapsody in Blue combined in one performance. Yeah, it's just a great thing to see. And there's a, a wonderful spot where you have a tap interlude uh, that that was great. How did you come to think of that? It was so theatrical. In fact, the whole concert is so theatrical. Uh, in terms of how we decided to shape the Rhapsody in Blue for for our particular setup, uh, I think I well in in many ways uh, dancing a 16 minute work solo is a pretty unusual and daunting task for for a dancer, and not even from a from a stamina standpoint, but just from creating an arc, an uninterrupted arc of of 16 minutes. And Rhapsody has such a powerful sort of dramatic arc of its own. And I wanted to complement that. I wanted to support it as a, as a musical idea, but I also, I think my interest is, is always in trying to understand how that arc or how, what music I'm approaching uh, appeals or applies to me as an artist, not, oh, what, you know, from, a, from an objective perspective, what, what is the most interesting thing about this work just from a subjective perspective, what, what is, what does this section feel like to me? Um, and how, how does it relate to me? Um, and then in this case, since I get to share this with, with Conrad at piano, it's not me dancing to a recording. I get to say, what about this appeals or applies to us? What is unique about our, our uh, artistic relationship that makes this particular scenario unique? Um, part of that was allowing certain things which almost feel like uh, inevitable conclusions in Rhapsody for those who are familiar with the work, sort of uh, not, not, not subverting, but for subversion's sake, but subverting for the sake of allowing people to expand their listening of Rhapsody in Blue, not saying, oh, and here comes the, the second theme. Da, da, da. Yeah. You know, we, we wanted people <laughs> to hear Rhapsody in a new way. Um, and, and not for novelty, but because we want people to hear it the way that we hear it. Um, so I, I you know, in terms of what decisions we made, I don't, there's I don't remember. Yeah. Hundred, <laughs> hundreds of decisions go, go through every moment of a rehearsal, yeah. um, you know, uh, negotiations or, or ideas and, and trying to track those ideas. We'd have to, we'd have to record all of our <laughs> rehearsals and then go back and follow the dots or something. Yeah, we, need a, uh, we need a rehearsal stenographer. That's what yeah, <laughs> exactly. We, we would need a stenographer. But for the most part, it was just a great joy. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful work. And it, it, as, a, as a born and, born and bred and living in New Yorker, um, Rhapsody in Blue feels, feels like New York to me. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. agree, even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, I was thinking about this comment that Gershwin made that really apply about this piece that applies to you and this concert. He, he said something about it's he talks about his piece as a kaleidoscope and uh, we could we could find the quote, but the part of it that stuck in my mind was unduplicated pep and, and in terms of the American spirit. It was just mm -hmm. <laughs> such a funny but but very apt kind of a thing. Uh, and we wanted to talk there are just so many things we'd love to ask you about. Um, but Michelle, we wanted to talk to them about the Mozart, about the piece that is, you're really like an opera star on Broadway. It's amazing. But tell us about this piece and about how you and David Parker put it together. How did it come about? I, I think less like an opera star on Broadway and more like an opera star having a psychotic break. <laughs> um, that's, how it, that's how it feels to me. Um, 
the the piece uh, is choreographed by David Parker, who is a, a, a friend and colleague and mentor to me um, as a as a dancer. His his dance company, The Bang Group, is based in New York City, and I began teaching them company class in tap dance, mm. um, and ended up filling in for for certain performances here and there. And maybe about two or three years into our working relationship, he had an idea of turning a piece that he had. Uh, experimented with in a performance before the uh, uh, Mozart uh, Rondo Alaturk, um, and he he wanted to turn it into a solo. And the the premise is relatively straightforward in that the the composition will be sung and danced simultaneously, and there is rearranging of parts essentially. Um, at the beginning, I I begin by dancing the left hand. You know, as say it's a piano arrangement, I'm dancing the left hand and singing the right hand. And then two bars later, I switch to singing the left hand and dancing the right hand. And there's some very sort of uh, very straightforward or very recognizable creative, creative uh, ideas at play. And then it starts to get just a bit more frantic or frenetic or, or chaotic as time goes on. And I really enjoy the experience of sort of testing the boundaries of the of the uh the hilarity uh, of 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 the work i i think it's become such a trope um uh and it's become such a trope and not not necessarily in a good way you know i mm-hmm. imagine like old you know cartoons where they have someone riding on a tiny bicycle and they play that <laughs> in the background or something and so i, I feel like you know connected connected to that <laughs> i feel connected to the cartoonish uh, uh, version of Mozart, as well as uh, a version that sees this as a as a very legitimate, very uh, virtuosic work. Mm-hmm. In terms of embodying it within my my own personhood, uh, it it's quite fun. And mostly, I, I sort of go and in, go into some sort of weird space, and I'm just glad that people are enjoying me watching. You know, watching me do it. Um, for most part, it's it's just a sort of internal internal roller coaster that. Uh, seems to turn into some external product, um, but I should I should state that uh, David Parker is the full mastermind of the work. Um, I'm just I I've I just you know yell it out and tap dance it out. <laughs> well, I saw that he had said he knew what you could do before he wrote the piece, and that's why he wrote it for you like this, and it really mm-hmm. shows. I mean, it's what's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's so many colors and styles and ideas flashing by in this. And then at the same time, you have these beautiful pieces like the, the Schoenberg Waltz and uh, the Brahms Intermezzo, which are so intensely lyrical and so on. How did you choose those pieces that are such a complement to these uh, other more bravura pieces? I, well, one guiding thought of mine just throughout the whole thing was like, um, we start the program with Bach with uh, with the aria from the Goldberg Variations, and and so we kind of we start with Johann Sebastian Bach, and if we're looking at Johann Sebastian Bach as like a really pivotal figure in the history of like European classical music, um, so much of that music is rooted in a dance tradition. Um, between uh, earlier music, like Renaissance music pre uh, Bach, but also like within Bach's repertoire, within um, the many, many dance suites that make up Bach's oeuvre. So I think something that was in my mind was bringing in like the different ways that I think remnants of that importance of dance in the classical tradition, like how different ways that that has manifested across uh, the centuries of classical music history. And so um, the Walzer from the Schoenberg Opus 23, like it's, it's, it's a little, the title is a little tongue in cheek. It's not, it's not necessarily, it's not a Chopin waltz per se, but I, I, but it has, it works with these lilts and um, rhythms that resemble and, and evoke waltz form. And, and so that was really exciting to me. I also uh, wanted Uh, I hope to articulate what I hear as a sort of harmonic um, relationship between Schoenberg's work uh, and like early 20th century jazz, which is where the Cherokee arrangement that we do together is rooted. It's rooted in like 40s stride piano and like actually in terms of time period, we're talking about like World War II era um, 
musical developments. And so I, I think I often hear the rich dissonances or, or what we think of as dissonances in, in the Schoenberg Walzer, uh, say, as having this kind of colorful richness that I that has always attracted me to the jazz lineage, uh, so that those that's one example of what was on my mind. Similar things apply to the Ravel uh, minuet, uh, which is from the Sonatina uh, by Ravel, um, but it's a similar thing, wanting to bring in this music that isn't intended necessarily to be explicit dance music, but mm -hmm. both uh, as indicated through its title and also just like it's in the music's DNA, like it is still referential to really deep traditional dance. Um, and then the Brahms just at the center of, to uh, is, is really just sometimes you just play something because you love it and it's beautiful. <laughs> and actually I do want to say that like Caleb and I were talking about this program now uh, with these larger ideas and overarching themes and, and uh, like different ways of thinking about it narratively. But uh, I'll just speaking for myself, I also think that in designing the program, we were both really trying to operate from a subconscious place. And, and a lot of the feeling of where things went on this program ultimately came down to how it felt when we started doing it together and how it felt like in sequence. And we really tried to trust that instinct as well it shows throughout the, the whole program it's very poetic and the transitions that you make are are so expressive i think that's not easy to do sometimes if, if, if you don't have a through composed idea to start with but obviously you did and it really shows thank um, you very much Michelle, what other, we had just a couple more things we were going to talk about here let's see what else is on your list um, I had one interesting thing for Caleb. I read somewhere about you indicating that um, skateboarding should be classified as a dance. Um, I was going to, to figure out, is it the body moves? Uh, what would make you um, make that statement? Mm -hmm. um, there was, back in... I won't even pretend like I know the year. Gene Kelly did an omnibus special called Dance is mm -hmm. a Sport. Um, and his interest was in aligning the qualities of sportsmanship and of athletic technique to the ideas of dance. I think this was potentially to help erase the stigma that men uh, don't or should not dance. So it's an mm -hmm. emasculating uh, experience. And I, I believe uh, on the omnibus special, he had uh, you know a, a pitcher from the Yankees uh, show up and pitch some balls and and show the form and you know things like that. I, I say all this to say people are always there's an article every couple of years which is uh, I feel unnecessary which says is dance a sport and and it makes the case yes or no and my answer is whatever it doesn't really matter it's whatever meaning it has for you so. Um, I answer your question uh, about the skateboarding being classified as a dance. Is skateboarding a dance form? Whatever. It, mm -hmm. it is to me because it inspires me in the way that watching different dance forms will. Um, and it does, not, uh, it does not appeal to me in the way that I want to see who won the competition. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, wanna, I want to watch skateboarding for its sort of um, result-less, its, its answer-less, its sort of... Um, it's sort of inspiring qualities. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time thinking about sort of uh, comparisons that I feel. Uh, skateboarding and skateboarders tend to see what they do as a sort of uh, spiritual experience to be embodied, mm -hmm. to be navigating space and time and the laws of physics. And I think tap dance has a lot of similarities. Um, uh, you know, tap dancers are trying to bend space and time. Um, we. Uh, uh, a lot of artists are um, in different disciplines, uh, but yeah, I've, I've really gotten hooked on skateboarding, but I also grew up in the 90s. So uh, I think we all had a, a deep interest <laughs> in skateboarding in the 90s. And, and I think it's from what I can see on TikTok or whatever, it's happening again now. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know, you were... Uh, you guys really are showing, of course, some serious technical 
chops in, in a lot of this whole thing in many ways, but I, I couldn't help but be struck by the things that you were doing in the Cherokee um, sequence, not only from the piano, which was just outrageous, but dancing too. And it's like you're going through a lexicon, a whole vocabulary uh, from our Tatum and then your own additions to this and so on. I was thinking about the title of that Jelly Roll Morton piece, The Finger Breaker, because that's really <laughs> what this is for sure. Um, how, how did you, what, how, what, what did you, where did, what was your starting point? What was your starting point for that one? I mean, it's, it was that Tatum recording, uh, which I think is from like the whole, the Pablo records, um, set of recordings. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess, like I said earlier, there's just, I, I, I'm really interested in uh, finding a connection between like German modernism and uh, like early 20th century American jazz music. Like it, it, it's, it, I cannot fully explain to you why, but like in my mind, they just gel. And also like I should mention that I think something on my mind was that um, Schoenberg and Gershwin, when they lived in LA together, were very good friends. Um, but- I didn't know that. I, I, I hope, I well now I hope That's that I'm being correct. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but it, it's always stuck in my mind. They were tennis buddies. And um, so there's just a desire to like, I think it was just like a desire to celebrate like the extraordinary, like outrageous um, capacity and originality of Tatum as a player um, to to make sure to like highlight the tradition of playing tunes and improvising on top of tunes since essentially on some level that's like what we're doing this entire program. Um, I, I also just as a pianist, it's really good practice to try like emulating Tatum and, and taking after Tatum because it's hard to do. And, mm -hmm. um, and I used to joke that like, I've been playing this Cherokee arrangement myself. Um, I've, I've found multiple uh, different transcriptions of it and, and have worked with it for a few years now. And I remember joking to my friends that like, I, I, I like to practice it whenever I want to feel like inadequate about my left hand technique. <laughs> um, just because Tatum has these huge hands. Um, it's just, it, it, it was really a no brainer. This was one of the things that remained in this program in some form from day one, right, Caleb? Yeah. Um, I think we, we had interest in including something uh, from the tradition of jazz music. Um, and I think from a virtuosic stretch, Tatum is, is the ultimate. Um, I don't think you can find harder things in the sort of canon of, of jazz interpreters than you can find in, in what Tatum has chosen to do. Um, and yeah, you know, in many ways, I sort of agree with, with Conrad in that it was just challenging. And it's sometimes good to feel like you're maybe, you know, skirting failure um or or attempting failure um to some extent uh it and you know in many ways i i do say that there is a lot of virtuosity on the duo program but i don't i in, in terms of the sort of tap dance scene that's out there i do not consider myself uh, a tap dance virtuoso compared to some of the some of my colleagues who are out and about um you know performing these days but in moments like dancing to Tatum's Cherokee, you know, interpretation of Cherokee, I feel like I'm, I'm cutting my teeth. I feel like I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying my best. <laughs> well, I saw your comment. You said something that it, when you were writing about this program, you said, I, I'm a dancer and you're a very versatile dancer, but you don't consider yourself a tap dancer, but you could fool us. Let's say that, you know. <laughs> well, mostly in that I think, uh, you know, this is a, a question of identity. I definitely yeah. consider myself a tap dancer, but I also consider myself so many different things. Um, I probably my two, my two most common practices outside of being a tap dancer are being a vernacular jazz dancer and a swing dancer, particularly a Lindy Hopper. And when I go to a tap dance space, I think the tap dance scene considers me potentially, oh, that tap dancer who swing dances. 
uh, or, you know, the swing dancer who tap dances. And when I go into a swing dance space, they say, oh, that's the tap dancer. So in the case of how I'm supposed to self-identify as an artist, I think yeah. it usually comes down to what is the thing that I am, that it makes me different in a particular room. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think a lot of people feel this way, um, but you can spend your whole life trying to call yourself a tap dancer because it is definitely a, it's a way of life. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a good segue into the Swing 2 piece that you wrote together. Maybe talk about the larger work that you did and then this segment that people will see on our program. Oh, maybe Conrad. Okay. I Well, so Swing 2 is, uh, is a, a small piece from our larger evening length work, the piece that brought Caleb and I together uh, in uh, starting in 2018. Uh, More Forever. And More Forever was written uh, across like three different uh, short residencies, like one in February, one in May, one in October, like across 2018. So the piece was written across a year, but also in these like lovely concentrated bursts where we all got to spend several days together and several hours a day together and, and just create together. And this piece Um, I I came to that first residency with some material already prepared, but this piece really grew out of our sessions together and, um, and and like was pretty much written from the ground up at this residency in the rehearsal studio and, uh, and with like this back and forth. And, um, I remember at the time of writing, like in 2018, just being so excited by how, as we were building this piece together, um, how the steps that Caleb was bringing in uh, were, in this case, uh, like really their own melody and and were relating to what I was doing at the piano and the notes that I was choosing to play and, and writing down um, and related to them in, in a real, in in a contrapuntal way, in a, in a very dialogical way, and and it's just a really intimate piece, and and then and I think that like we all while making it felt very close to it and felt very um, mm-hmm. attached to it, and it makes it made its way into the overall evening length work, and more forever is a piece with piano. Um, six dancers and these six dancers are are dancing on sand and I uh, a lot of the time in my on my side of things I'm playing piano but I'm also working with electronics either live processing my piano sound or you know playing pre-programmed stuff that I've made and built Um, but swing two is this moment of really pared down intimacy it's just me piano and dancers what is funny is that Ultimately, in the final work, Swing 2 is danced by everyone except for Caleb. And so, uh, and I don't want to speak for Caleb, but I think that this might be, like, in some ways, the most special little section of the piece to us. And so, um, I, I think, I think Caleb, I think it was you who pushed for Swing 2 being on this program um, for exactly that reason. I- I did. Yeah. I, I love swing two as a composition. It is, it's, I would love to say something uh, grand and logical, but it is purely dripping with sentiment for Pete, for, for me. Mm-hmm. I love this piece. I love hearing Conrad play it. I love dancing to it. Um, and so it was a, a purely selfish uh, uh, request on my behalf, you know, it's sort of like if I if I could ask Conrad to play anything, I would probably ask him to play swing too. Um, and so for me to get to to engage with that in a performative setting just brought me a lot of joy. Um, the piece is definitely wrapped up in a sort of like a, a autobiographical experience. It feels it feels very connected to a particular uh, point in my life and in and in my starting. It was really Conrad wrote swing to in the first week that we had a really intensive working experience together. And so it feels very, it feels in a, in no particular uh, narrative way, um, just in a sort of how it feels when I hear it, it reminds me of, of sort of where I was and how I was and how I felt in that moment um, uh, as we started working together. And so um, it's, it's really, 
it's really just pure sentiment for me. Um, I love the piece. I also should say, yes, Conrad mentions that in its original context, I would be dancing on sand. We couldn't do so for practical reasons for this duo concert, but uh, adding sand to the stage adds a, a particular sort of tonal quality and a particular feeling. And it also expands the, uh, the capacity to hear longer notes um, in the way that, you know, it's, it's imagining if you, if you were playing uh, piano, but never had the option to put down a pedal, that is often uh, how it feels in tap dance. Or at least if, if you can extend notes, it's from the scrape of a foot and it's, it's a relatively uh, lighter sound or less impactful sound. But as soon as you add sand to leather soled shoes, you get, you get a, a very particular sound, which does feel um, uh, melodic and, and really, really particular. Um, so the only, the only thing I wish we could have done for this duo program is for me to have poured some sand down, but, uh, yeah. logistics, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, it's, yeah, it's just, uh, I feel, I feel very proud to have, uh, to, to have been part of, uh, Conrad's composing of that work. I feel like that work will, will, you know, be my rosebud, you know, or something like that at, at, at the end of my, at the end of my day. <laughs> I, I wanted to just mention that uh, before we before we wind up our talk, that the library actually has a tremendously important dance history. We're we're really known for music, perhaps more worldwide, but um, we have major dance collections here. And in terms of our history, um, we hope that viewers might take a moment and look up a few of the items uh, on the website that I mentioned earlier, but also uh, they can. Um, look into, but also they can look into some of the things that make our history so significant. For example, uh, Igor Stravinsky worked with Adolf Böhm to do the ballet Apollon Mozeget, which was our commission in 1928. Mm -hmm. And the, the Appalachian Spring that Aaron Copeland and Martha Graham created was created for our stage. We wish you guys could be on our stage right now in the future, but we hope. We do too. And uh, we, we have a number of, of uh, projects. That we had a new piece commissioned by Pontus Lidberg when we celebrated the Graham and Copeland legacy a few years ago. That was the first time we had a new dance commission on our stage for a number of years. Uh, and so in terms of our collections, our, our dance curator, Libby Smigel, is working to collect things all the time. And uh, we have just a huge group of things like the Nijinska, Bronislava Nijinska collection, um, Alvin Ailey Company, and so on. So think about giving your papers. Uh, <laughs> you're not quite there yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll cut that out of our, our, our talk here. But, but <laughs> no, they, seriously, uh, you know, they, we love to advertise. So no, they're, what, they're always what there. Yeah, what, what else? Uh, I, I think we uh, pretty much covered it all. Um, it has been absolutely fantastic being able to hear some of the creative process, which is not something that we're always able to do. And the, the combination of the two of you together, I, you know, the stars must have come together and exploded because it looks as if you've done this for years and you're too young to have done it for too many years, but it, it's, it's truly a work of art. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs>